from the world of politics. The message is nobody wants Uncle Sam in their doctor's office. The Supreme Court is saying, yeah, they they want to make these decisions for us. To the world of business. It's clear that inflation is a challenge. The United States is in a better position than virtually any other country to address this challenge and do what is necessary to bring prices down without having to give up all of the economic gains that we have made. This is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. The big news today, without a doubt, of those CPI numbers. Everybody was waiting for them. They came out with the headline number at 8.2 percent, down a tad, but boy, sky high. And more important, the core number at 6.6 percent, really hurting. Michael McKee from Bloomberg, he's Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent, is here. Mike, tell us about these numbers. They certainly uh, shook the markets. Well, if you look at the uh, tables uh, of the numbers, you see that it's not just the year over year that's bad because the Fed's looking at month over month to see if there's any kind of sequential improvement, and there was not. <laughs> the uh, headline month over month was up four tenths instead of the one tenth in August, and the core up six tenths for the second month in a row. People thought last month's rise was maybe a fluke. It wasn't, and a lot of that has to do with uh, the composition of the increases. Housing prices. The owner's equivalent rent up eight tenths percent. It had been rising at a seven tenths pace for several months, and people thought that might go down. Nope, uh, did not go down. Went up, and it's uh, up six point seven percent of the year. Gasoline did go down. Uh, we knew that would happen, but now gas prices are going back up again. So the October number probably won't be as good. Food voters. Look at food prices, and you can see they're still rising. Food at home is the equivalent of the grocery store, and they're up on a 13% uh, basis on the year. Used cars were expected to drop, but they didn't drop as much as anticipated. Apparel is about the only case where people are getting what they expected. Inventories built up a lot, and so uh, retailers have been holding sales, and apparel prices went down. But for the most part, David, the numbers in the CPI were all positive on all more than people anticipated, and that is not good news for the administration. Well, not good news for the administration. What about the people out there? Are there any people benefiting from all this? Well, if you want to call it a benefit, the one group that the president might be able to appeal to is senior citizens, because every October, the Social Security Administration calculates the cost of living increase they will get for the next year based on the CPI through September. And this year, it's going to be 8.7 percent. That is the highest since 1981. Not a particularly flattering comparison in terms of the years, but it is uh, enough to keep up with inflation for that group uh, of voters. Mike, thank you so very much. That's Bloomberg's own Michael McKee reporting from Washington, actually. In the meantime, we talked earlier today with the Secretary of Commerce, she's Gina Ramonda, and we asked her exactly about what's going on with inflation, what the plan is, and she said, essentially, we're going to have to be patient. This is a global problem. There's not a country on Earth right now not struggling with inflation. And as we put COVID behind us and get back to business as usual in the supply chain, I think, you know, the Fed's action will start to uh, have an effect and consumers will continue to feel it. But it, it takes a bit of time for the Fed's actions and the supply chain actions that we've taken to work its way through the system. So to take us through these numbers and what they tell us about the economy, welcome now Torsten Slock. He's chief economist, Apollo Global Management. Torsten, always great to have you here. Let's pick on exactly what uh, Gina Ramondo was talking about there. It's going to take some time. How much time? What is, what is the momentum telling us in this uh, economy right now? Yeah, well, it was expected to come down relatively quickly initially, and then we came up all the way to 8 9 percent. So the problem is, of course, that we are at elev elevated levels that are so much higher than the FOMC's 2% target. Uh, the ACP, the summary of economic projections from the Fed themselves, says that this might take two, three years before we get down anything near close to two. But uh, the answer is that uh, the speed with which things are coming down, including today, is unfortunately just a lot slower than what the market had hoped for. So take us below the top line numbers to some of the things that make up these CPI numbers. What are the things that tend to be sticky or keep going the same direction? For example, perhaps shelter. 
Yeah, that's very important because if you look at what really is moving in today's data is that the goods part of the economy, which generally tends to be the interest rate sensitive components of GDP, has been slowing down. So that's housing, that's capex spending, meaning investment by companies, is also the car sector, the auto sector has also been slowing. That's because those types of spending all require financing. But the issue is that those types of spending, the goods sector only makes up about 20% of GDP. 80% of the GDP is consumer services and services more broadly. And services includes also people going to restaurants, that's been very strong still, people flying on airplanes still very strong, people staying at hotels very strong, sports, concerts, everything that has to do with services continues to do quite well. So therefore, as long as the consumer is so strong, we create still jobs, wage growth is still strong, savings are still strong, it is still the case that the services components of the CPI still has quite a tailwind. So it requires more Fed rate hikes to really cool that part of the economy down. What happened to that promised peaking of inflation? I mean, we've been talking about that for months now. I remember in late spring people were saying, I think it's peaking about now. It doesn't look that way to me. No, and that's why this is a very humbling number for markets and for, in particular, the economics profession. I mean, the forecast from the consensus, also the forecast from the Fed, have said throughout this period when inflation has been going up to 8 9%, that, oh, this is the peak, now we're going down, now we're going down. And initially, of course, there was a lot of talk about this being transitory. The problem is that it's now becoming more entrenched, and that's why it might be taking now a little bit longer time before inflation comes down. It will eventually come down again, and it will probably take the two or three years that the Fed is predicting here, but it is a little bit at the moment premature to declare victory when the Fed's target is 2%, and inflation today came out at 8.2. You heard Gina Ramonda, the Secretary of Commerce there, say, you know, supply chain things are really getting unwound now, we're going to have a much more supply chain. In, in remedying this problem of inflation, how much of it's going to be in supply chain, and how much of it's going to be, let's be frank, demand destruction by really jacking up the rates? Yeah, that's a really important question. Is it demand that drove inflation higher, or is it supply? Meaning, was it because of stimulus checks or unemployment benefits and PPP loans and excess savings, or was it because of supply chain problems. The Fed working papers that have looked at that question have found that two-thirds of the reason why inflation went up had to do with supply. So maybe we just need to wait a little while longer and then some of the supply chain problems will resolve themselves. But even if a third of the increase in inflation was because of demand, that does mean that we probably do need some more demand destruction. And the problem is that the Fed funds rate going up has really only created some destruction in the goods part of the economy. It hasn't really slowed down consumption of services, in particular, again, travel, sports, concerts, everything, transportation, everything that has to do with spending on the services side. Restaurants, in particular, also continue to be very strong. And that also suggests that we might need a higher level of Fed funds rate to really cool the services part of the economy down. Torsten, you, of course, are an economist. You're not a markets guy. But at the same time, the two are directly linked. What are the risks for the markets at this point? We certainly have seen a mess. I think it's a technical term over in the Bank of England and what's going on in the UK. What is the risk that we could have some market breakdown here with this kind of tumult? Yeah, that's very important because, I mean, in plain English, what's going on is that the Fed is trying to cool the US economy down. The Bank of England is trying to cool the UK economy down, and the ECB is trying to cool the European economy down. The problem is that when you do that and you raise interest rates very, very quickly, it raises the risk of a financial accident. And that's, of course, when you have those financial accidents where suddenly something in the financial system starts to become more troubled, then you do need to step in, as the Bank of England has been doing more recently. And that's created this very special situation where, on the one hand, the Bank of England wants to tighten policy, but on the other hand, they also want to ease policy to make sure that financial stability is still relatively stable and not being too challenged. So the very difficult situation is for policymakers, including in the US, that they want to maintain financial stability while at the same time raising interest rates very, very quickly, much faster than in 1994. And that's, of course, opening up this debate about can they do this? Can they raise interest rates without a financial accident? And if there is a financial accident, how do they then deal with that? Because at the one hand, they can't both ease and tighten at the same time. Well, whether it's the ECB or the Bank of England or the, United, or the Federal Reserve, there are a couple of different mechanisms they have. One is the interest rate. The other actually is quantitative easing or quantitative tightening. How much pressure is this putting on central banks on the quantitative tightening part, which they've just started into? Because that really reduces liquidity and doesn't that increase the chance of an accident? Yeah, absolutely. And this becomes very important when you think about the yield curve, because what the central banks and the Bank of England and the Fed have total control over is short-term interest rates. 
But what they also, of course, now to deal with is that maybe something is getting impacted by long-term interest rates going up, and in the UK, long-term interest rates going up so quickly. So that's why they had to reverse from QT to QE literally overnight. Basically, that was not what anyone expected, but that is essentially also another way of them trying to make sure that financial stability is still maintained in a way where they try to make sure that long-term interest rates don't go up too quickly and financial conditions do tighten, but at the same time, the main tool they have is short-term interest rates going up. So for the yield curve, is creating these tensions that short rates are going up, but there's now a higher risk that long rates might not go up so much, and therefore the yield curve will probably likely flatten globally because there is this risk that if there is a financial accident, we might see a quick reversal in long-term interest rates coming down, just like we saw in the UK. Torsten, it's always so helpful to have you here. Thank you so much for being with us. That's Torsten Slock of Apollo Global Management. Coming up on the eve of bank earnings, we talk with the Dean of Bank Regulations, Raj Cohen of Sullivan Cromwell. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, it feels like everywhere you look, there's some form of tumult in the markets, whether it's over in the UK or back here in the United States. And in the middle of all this, we're going to start with bank earnings tomorrow. And to take us through what we should look for in those bank earnings, we welcome now Raj Cohen. He's senior chairman of Solomon Cromwell, and as I always say, the dean of all banking regulation. Raj, thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate it. Give us a viewer's guide here to bank earnings as we go into them. Given what's going on in the markets with increased rates, CPI, inflation going through the roof, a lot of slowdown. What should we be looking for in bank earnings? Hey, David. Well, it's always a pleasure to be with you. And I think we should start with the proposition that you have asked the, the correct question, uh, what is going to be the level and impact on bank earnings? Because the underlying strength of the system, the banking system, I think should be indisputable, high capital levels, high liquidity levels, still strong asset quality. But your point is the right one. It is inflation and what that is doing uh, to uh, uh, the price of uh, fixed rate securities, fixed rate loans. There are offsets here. Deposits become more valuable in a high rate environment. And ultimately, um, as in your prior segment, uh, you suggested, if you were able to uh, start to change uh, the direction of the economy, uh, banks do no better than their customers. And if customers start to have problems, that will start to seep through into bank earnings. But again, there's, they, the banks, are sitting in a real position of strength today. Well, well uh, Raj, I don't expect you to be a clairvoyant here. At the same time, you understand these banks terribly well. As we go into these earnings, would you expect a trade-off, as you just suggested, between a net interest income on deposits because rates are going up, and I know the banks have been hurting because they have been down at zero, on the one hand, and, for example, investment bank income on the other because it looks like deals are drying up, but as I understand it, high-yield credit is really cracking. Right. So let's take each of those uh, pieces Clearly, uh, M&A has slowed way down, offerings have slowed way down, and that will have an impact on uh, revenues generated from those businesses. Also, asset and wealth management, as values of the securities go down, fees go down. But as you also point out, um, the spread on deposits will increase. They do not rise in terms of rates nearly as quickly as the loan book. And so there are offsets. Uh, the only other feature I think you do need to look out for is whether there are banks which are significantly mismatched on the wrong side. Most, most banks try and get to pretty close to even on interest rate risk, but if anybody's been trying to play the curve, uh, they could be uh, in for quite a disappointment. Raj, you say that the banking system is in really strong shape overall. We probably won't need to worry about that. At the same time, there is concern about the markets. We saw something break down in the United Kingdom, apparently because of the attempt to, to really change the budget over there, and the Bank of England had to step in. And there's reports that there's really a shortage of liquidity in U.S. Treasuries. How concerned should we be about that? 
Well, if we have to be concerned about U.S. Treasuries, then we have a real concern overall because I think it is, again, indisputed that this is the single most liquid market in the world. Um, that's not to say it can't happen. We saw it happen in uh, uh, 2020. But uh, I really worry not about uh, the banks, but it's the unregulated segments or the less regulated segments of the financial services industry. Uh, you don't know what you don't know. And if you don't regulate, if you don't have information, that's where an accident can happen. You mentioned highly leveraged lending. Banks, I think, for the most part, have uh, quite uh, rigid guidelines on how much they will do. So how much of that has moved out of the banking system to a place where no one really knows? Well, no one. Does that include the Federal Reserve? Does that include the Treasury? How much visibility do they have into things like some of the private credit areas, the non-bank banks? Because they seem to have been growing leaps and bounds. I think not nearly as much as they should have. I do think that the uh, Fed and Treasury try and keep tabs on what is going on in the non-regulated markets. But by definition, they don't have the access uh, that they do to regulated institutions. Going back, my recollection, at least, of the great financial crisis back in 2008, one of the issues was derivatives. And now they seem to have popped up again in the United Kingdom with respect to the pension plans. As I understand it, they went into some derivatives to try to really take care of long-term liabilities. What is the situation on the visibility in derivatives trading today? It's a lot better. There have been a number of reforms uh, since 2008. You're absolutely right. It, it started with AIG, but it certainly didn't end there. And it is a way, derivatives can be a way to build up a lot of leverage and a lot of risk. I think there is more insight. Uh, there is more in the way of central clearing. But in any instrument which can be leveraged, uh, to a great extent, there is greater risk. It's just by definition. Uh, finally, Raj, if, if in fact we may be headed into a slower period of growth here, even recession, we heard President Biden allow that there might be a recession in the United States. Other people think it's a higher chance than that. If that's true, is there any prospect for some loosening around the edges, at least, of some of the regulations on banks, particularly with respect to reserves, so there would be more liquidity in the system, more lending? Um. At this point in time, I would doubt you would see anything significant in the way of loosening. But what you might see is discouragement of raising regulatory requirements. There has been a fair amount of questioning whether capital ratios should be um, raised. And if there were anything that were pro-cyclical, in a sense, in the wrong way, in uh, driving credit access down, it would be to raise capital requirements uh, when uh, there is a reduced availability to obtain credit and more need. Okay, Rajan, it's always such a pleasure to have you with us. Really informative. That's Rajan Cohen. He is Solomon Cromwell Senior Chairman. Coming up, we're going to take a look at the federal budget and how higher interest rates could really affect what we can afford. And we're going to talk about that with Maya McGinnis of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. season is coming. The market's bracing for another big earnings season. Everyone is expecting it to be poor. We've had big markdowns on earnings. Bloomberg breaks the numbers first. The bar has already been set pretty low. The big question is, can it go lower? We're seeing some pretty bad earnings already from those who have reported. With exclusive expert analysis. Which aspects of the market are not sufficiently priced? Is this a macro huge headwind? There is some really bright light at the end of this tunnel. When is this floor going to come? When can I start buying? Bloomberg Television and Radio. The fastest numbers and analysis you trust.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West, and the markets are having a wild ride today in response to those CPI numbers and maybe something else. To take us through it, welcome now Kriti Gupta. So, Kriti, what is going on? I mean, they sold off a lot at the at the first, and now they've come back. A complete turnaround story. I think we were down some 2.4 percent at session lows, and I think we're up by uh, as much as 2.4 percent on session highs. We've kind of faded some of those gains there, but nevertheless, what's interesting is that on a day where you have a hot CPI print, we saw a pretty um, pretty tough reaction to that. That you are seeing this turnaround story, a 1,000 point turnaround uh, intraday swing in the Dow, by the way, for those uh, who watch uh, th that specific index. I think there's several things you can point to here when it comes to why did you see this turnaround. And I think the chief among them is simply going to be the positioning going into it. And you can see it in futures trading. If you were to pull up, for example, um, an intraday chart of futures, you could see this kind of build up into uh, the, the report, which tells you that people were kind of going into this so bullish anyway. The idea here being that uh, this would be some sort of confirmation that the inflation print uh, is in fact or, of, or in the past is has been the peak and that the deceleration going into the next month we're going to get to that 8.1% number David think about it we've had two months now where the estimate has been 8.1% and for two months now we have missed that estimate inflation has come in hotter so that really just kind of drops the bar even lower for the equity market when it goes into next month and I wonder how much of that is being pulled forward uh, why aren't they reacting to the bond market because I mean you've got uh, five points roughly on the tenure but it's like 14 points on the two-year. Right, but look at the turnaround, though, that you did actually see, because I think at, the, at its peak, we had a 23 basis point jump in the two-year. The, the, it was going up to, I think, 4.5 percent, if I if I was looking at that right. At the same time, the Fed swaps were pricing in an almost 5 percent terminal rate in March 2023, which, by the way, Anna Wong of Bloomberg Economics called yeah. way ahead uh, of everyone else. I, I think you are seeing a, a pretty equal reaction in the bond market that you're seeing in the equity market, this kind of turnaround to whatever the knee-jerk reaction was. But bond market is going to be much stickier because it has the Federal Reserve to price in and that kind of hawkish terminology, whereas this equity market is still pricing in earnings, is still pricing in geopolitics. The bond market is going to be more tailored and more uh, closely matching the Fed policy. So let me push you now. We're going into earnings season. We've got the bank earnings starting tomorrow, right? Yeah. How does this all read against earnings for corporations? I mean, to what extent are we going to be paying attention to ability to raise prices, right. pricing power, and the costs going up for companies? Well, I think a lot, actually. And the market's actually rewarding the companies who are able to lift their forecast. PepsiCo this week was a fantastic example because they said they increased their prices by 17 percent and they are still lifting their forecast. People are still spending. Delta even talking about their business travel becoming stronger um, and therefore their profits getting higher as well. And the market rewarded them for it even earlier in the session when the stock market on a benchmark level was in the red. So I think that's going to be more of a micro story than a macro story. The macro story will still be federal reserve and that's where you'll see the spikes and drops in the S&P 500 broadly but then when it comes to earnings that's where the sum of all parts kind of comes into play and the fact that even with these layoffs and even in, with these cost cutting measures some of these companies will be rewarded if they're able to lift their guidance. Yeah but if it's all about the Fed which you say it's all about the Fed it looks like 75 basis points to me I mean I don't know but I just say if we were hoping to go down to 50 I'm not seeing it right now. Yeah and what's interesting is that it's now priced in for December as well not ah, just November. There you go thank you so much to Kriti Gupta you can catch her again at one p.m. Eastern Time, when she'll be anchoring Bloomberg Markets. Coming up, Republicans are talking about changing Social Security and Medicare in the new Congress. We're going to talk about what, what makes sense with Maya McGinnis. She's the president of Committee for a Responsible Budget. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West, and we want to keep you up to date with news from all around the world. And for that, we turn to Mark Crumpton here with The First Word. David, thank you. Now there's pressure on the Fed to raise interest rates even more aggressively. A closely watched measure of U.S. consumer prices rose by more than forecast to a 40-year high in September. The core CPI, which excludes food and energy, increased 6.6% from a year ago. Still, the White House pointed out that lower gasoline prices are a sign of progress. It's clear that inflation is a challenge. It is a global challenge. We are seeing some progress. If you look at annualized headline inflation over the last three months, it was about 2%. That's down from 11% in the prior quarter. Now, a lot of that is the significant reduction in energy prices and in gas prices at the pump. The overall CPI was up 8.2% from a year ago. 
In Florida, a jury has decided that school shooter Nicholas Cruz will get life without parole for the 2018 massacre at Parkland's Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Jurors said they could not unanimously agree that Cruz get the death penalty. A year ago, Cruz pleaded guilty to killing 14 students and three staff members and wounding 17 others. Pfizer said its booster raised more antibodies against the dominant strains of COVID-19 when compared with the original shot. In a study of 80 volunteers whose blood was collected after the booster, results showed an increase in neutralizing antibodies against the BA4 and BA5 subvariants. Still, Americans are slow to get the new shot as many await efficacy data set to be released in the coming weeks. 65 million people who get U.S. Social Security benefits will see their checks rise by the most in more than 40 years. They're getting an 8.7% cost of living adjustment starting in January. That will boost the average monthly benefit by roughly $140 per month. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. Well, just under four weeks from now, we're going to have midterm elections in the United States in which we decide who's going to run the House, as well as the Senate, for that matter. And there are already thoughts that perhaps Republicans could take over the House of Representatives. And then people are asking, what might they do with it? We welcome now Jack Fitzpatrick, congressional reporter for Bloomberg Government. Jack, you have a terrific report on the Bloomberg right now that addresses one particularly pesky problem, which is the debt ceiling. Explain what the debt ceiling means, when it comes up, and what it could mean for new legislation. Yeah, the debt ceiling deadline is hard to pinpoint, but the latest estimate is there's going to be a deadline uh, to, to uh, suspend or increase that limit around the third quarter of the next calendar year. So that will be a big fight, uh, especially if Republicans can, in fact, get the House and or the Senate. Uh, it'll be have, to, have to be a bipartisan negotiation. Uh, the members I've spoken to, which include all of the members on the Republican side who are interested in being budget chairman if they win the House, say that that is their big point of leverage to require some sort of fiscally conservative concession. Some of the things they brought up could be raising the age of eligibility for Social Security and Medicare, could be uh, potentially more of a welfare reform, quote-unquote welfare reform, work requirement focused uh, kind of legislation, could be discretionary spending caps. Uh, the idea of tying those demands to the debt limit is, is pretty explosive because if you miss that debt limit, miss the deadline, and the federal government starts defaulting on payments, uh, that is much worse than, say, a government shutdown that, that could potentially be, uh, as Janet Yellen has, has said, it would be an economic catastrophe and, and cast doubt on the federal government's ability to make payments that it has already agreed to make. So that is a major uh, a fight that is brewing for next year if Republicans can get either chamber of Congress. Well, in the past, at least, both Republicans and Democrats, at least in the end, have agreed it's just too catastrophic to actually default on the government debt. At the same time, you talk about explosions, when you start talking about uh, change changing Social Security, that politically can be pretty explosive as well. Are Republicans willing to take that on? You know, when you talk to safe seat Republicans who are interested in a committee leadership position, who are making their case that they should be in charge of the Budget Committee or the Ways and Means Committee to other conservatives, uh, I, I've been a little surprised at how willing to say, yes, we need to focus on entitlements, they are. Uh, it's tougher for swing district and swing seat members who don't want to have that conversation quite as directly. Uh, the big emphasis from Republicans, including the conservatives, is we would have have to protect uh, the benefits for people who are already, you know, at, at retirement age, at the eligibility age. Uh, but there would have to be a conversation, they say, about raising the age of eligibility, potentially more means testing and focusing it on poor and working class people. Uh, and it is something that leadership aligned and conservative Republicans are pushing the party to talk more about lately. Quite a story to watch in the new Congress. Thank you so much to Jack Fitzpatrick. He's congressional reporter for Bloomberg government. And now we're going to turn to somebody who really knows the federal budget inside and out, and particularly entitlements, as many people call them. Maya McGinnis is president of the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget. Maya, always great to have you on these. I want to talk about what I have been calling entitlements. I must say, yesterday on this program, I had a Democratic congresswoman take issue with even calling them entitlements. She thinks that makes it sound too impersonal. Well, is that an issue in itself, what we even call them? Uh, yeah, I get that feedback all the time. And honestly, 
I, I don't really think it's about the the name or the word. I think entitlement has always been a term that was generally accepted as describing mandatory programs, which mean that if you qualify for the program, you get those benefits and it doesn't go through the annual appropriations process. But call it whatever you want. We have a big problem with our mandatory programs, our entitlements, in that they are structurally unsound. And we do need to be talking about the policies that affect them and how we're going to strengthen those programs shore them up so they don't become insolvent. Well, Maya, let's go to exactly that point because my understanding for a distance, you have a much better understanding is we don't have any choice at some point about dealing with these, whatever the dealing with means, however we do it, because uh, like Social Security is going to go bankrupt, is it not? So th this is exactly right. This is not a question of if we're going to deal with Social Security. It's a question of when. And in terms of the when, we've already waited much longer than we should have. We have known for decades that the program has promised out more in benefits and it has the capacity to pay in revenues and savings in the trust funds. So we're going to have to do something to rebalance that program. As you alluded to right there, there are many choices. We can do it by raising revenues. We can do it by slowing the growth of benefits. We can do it by raising the retirement age. We can do a combination of all of them. But every year that we wait, and we've waited for many, I, I wrote my master's thesis on this in graduate school some time ago, and we've done nothing since then. Every year that we wait, it means that more of the burden is going to fall on people who cannot afford it and younger people instead of spreading those costs more gradually. So we're not doing ourselves any favor by pretending we don't have to fix the program so that they don't hit insolvency. So Maya, you are a student of this, obviously. Uh, give us your best analysis, because if you talk about things like, and I will say it's sort of cutting benefits, if you delay the time, that is the age you get, that's a way of cutting benefits. If you means test, say certain people can't get it because they get too much money otherwise, as opposed to raising the cap on the payroll tax so you raise more revenue, what is the best way to do it, or do we need to do all of the above? Yeah, well, I don't want to I don't want to give away the bottom line, because the first thing I'm going to say is we have an interactive tool called the Social Security Reformer. People can go and try their hand at it themselves. We've actually had members of Congress who used this tool to come up with plans. But um, in my opinion, there's no way to fix this program without doing all of the above. We're going to need more money. We're going to have to slow the growth of the benefits for people who don't need them as much. And we can't spend a third of our life in retirement. When the program started, the retirement age was 65. Life expectancy was 62. That's that's why the program worked back then. Now that the retirement age is gradually moving towards 67, but the uh, the retirement age is moving towards 67, our life expectancy is in the 70s, 80s, 90s. We can't afford it as structured. So you have to get at all of those issues, in my opinion, and that's the best way to have a balanced plan as well. Most people my I've talked to who know about these things say that the answer is pretty clear. You can quibble around the edges, but the overall answer is pretty clear. The problem is getting there. Is, do you see a path to get there? Yeah, the problem is not the policies. The policies are well understood and they're pretty clear. The problem is politics. And for so long now, politicians have preferred to run away from this issue or uh, clobber each other with it and make cartoons of people pushing grandma over the cliff and sort of demagogue to no end. And you also have the AARP getting involved where if anybody dares to say, we need to make changes to this program, which to be clear is 100% true. We have to make changes. There are many choices, but we have to. But if any politician's willing to say that, the AARP, before they're finished speaking, has ginned up a bunch of robocalls in their districts and they make it very difficult. So the politics of the issue is very tough. I do think that any, any reform plan should be bipartisan and reflect compromise. But right now you don't have a lot of politicians running towards doing hard things on policymaking in, in any area of the budget, and Social Security is one of the toughest for them to take on. Yeah, as you say, though, sooner or later they're going to have to deal with it. Thank you so much, Maya. Always great to have you. That's Maya McGinnis of the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Coming up, we're going to go to the White House for the view on the CPI numbers from the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, Cecilia Rouse. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power. I'm David Weston. We welcome now Dr. Cecilia Rouse. She is chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, coming from a rather w rainy White House outside of the front lawn. Thank you so much, doctor, for being with us. We obviously have been poring over these CPI numbers since they came out this morning, 8.30 Eastern time. They're higher than was expected, particularly the core is pretty disturbing. We've been poring over to see what is there good in these numbers. You've gone through them. Give us some good news. Can you find any in these numbers? 
Well, look, obviously these numbers reflect the fact that re inflation remains a challenge. It is why it is our number one focus here at the White House for the president. Uh, we are not alone. The rest of the world is dealing with inflation as well. It's the result of the pandemic and all of the havoc that that wrecked um, on uh, global economies. And then on top of that, we have Russia's war against Ukraine. So what we saw in these numbers was that the headline inflation came in a little hotter than we expected, but it is down if we look at the annualized three-month average that is down because energy prices have come down. Uh, obviously, that's highly, highly volatile. That'll depend on Russia. Uh, you pointed out that the core inflation uh, also was hotter than expected. It did not accelerate from last month, however. Uh, what we saw in the core inflation is goods, goods prices inflation was relatively flat, which meant that this was largely a story about services, largely shelter, largely medical services. You know, from the White House perspective, this really reflects how, like with health care, the Inflation Reduction Act really is uh, focused on the right problem. It's the tool to help deal families deal with uh, increasing medical costs. It's why the, the president's agenda has included uh, measures to increase the supply of housing. Um, and so I would say that this report uh, reflects that the Fed has continues will be, continue to be focused on reducing inflation. Um, we do know that more generally we're seeing signs that the economy is responding as the Fed hopes it will. Job openings came down last month. The economy, the employment numbers, while robust, are still down from the beginning of the year. Uh, people are, are spending their excess savings. So the economy is responding, but it will take some time. Uh, uh, Dr. Rouse, um, as an economist, uh, where do you find assurance that inflation is not becoming entrenched in this economy? I mean, what in these numbers might indicate it's not entrenched? Because it sure looks that way right at the moment. Well, I look, I don't have a crystal ball, but what I would take uh, some comfort in, if that's what we're going to call it, uh, is the fact that if we look at hourly wages, uh, they actually tick down. Uh, so that suggests that we're not going to see, we're not seeing wage price spiral, at least in, in these numbers. Uh, the fact that if we look more generally, we know that housing is beginning to soften. That's, that's what we would expect as the Fed is raising interest rates. Again, I point out that job openings came down last month with jolts. Uh, that is going to take some pressure off of the labor market. That's the kind of uh, cooling, easing that the Fed is hoping for. Because if we can see a reduction in the demand for workers without lots of layoffs, uh, that is the kind of soft landing that they hope to achieve. Initially, what we heard from people in the administration was what could really take care of inflation was to fix the supply chain problems. And I know you've spent a lot of time and effort on that issue. But to what extent will increased supply pull us out of this inflation as opposed to demand destruction? Well, look, we know we need to be keeping the supply going as well. And we are very, we have seen a lot of improvement there in terms of throughput at our ports, uh, other measures of supply chains. We're, we're not out of the woods yet. We know China's got a very aggressive COVID policy. Um, and we, so we're not done, but we've seen a lot of improvement there. Uh, you know, look, we know we need to see improvement in housing. Housing is a slow, uh, it's a, that's a slow of evolution. Uh, we know that if we look at most recent rents, that they are coming down. But part of the entrenchment of the housing and the BLS measure of, of housing services and, um, and rental service is that, uh, you know, rents are changed once a year for many people. And so it can take some time for uh, the kind of inflation we've been seeing to work its way through the system. But we, we do know that there, we're seeing some progress there. Uh, we heard President Biden earlier this week in an interview with CNN say at least there's a possibility of a recession. He didn't think it'd be too bad a recession coming up next next year. What do you see? What is the likely recession? And to some extent, do we need a recession to get inflation under control? Well, you know, a, re a recession is dated by the National Bureau of Economic Research, and it, and it really suggests that there's been a very profound retrenchment of the economy. So it's not just a slowdown but where we see uh, persistent uh, retraction. So the GDP is negative. We see uh, consumer spending uh, is, is very low. We see layoffs. We just see a, an economy that has contracted. Uh, we ha yes, we had, we've seen mildly negative GDP growth over the last two quarters, but it's been in areas such as inventories, which can be volatile and doesn't suggest a kind of structural contraction. We've seen a robust labor market, but then, but yet one that has cooled since the beginning of the year. So there's a path. You know, I don't have a crystal ball. I'm not going to sugarcoat this and suggest that the Fed is for sure going to pull this off. But there is definitely a path. We see the spending down of excess savings, and yet household balance sheets remain robust. So, um, you know, this is a challenge. It is a challenge that we share with our, uh, you know, our peer countries around the world. 
Uh, the, the good news is this president respects the independence of the Fed, wants fiscal policy to be complementary with monetary policy, which is the assurance I think we need to have in order to, to get the job done. As you know, we got some sobering numbers out of the IMF this this week uh, about global uh, economy. And uh, trade is certainly an important factor in that. Uh, wouldn't it make sense for the United States to remove some of the trade restrictions it has imposed, both to bring down the costs to U.S. consumers, but also to facilitate global trade? Why don't we do that? So, you know, the president is looking at this. It's complicated. It's part of the geopolitics. Uh, and so it's a, and a question we want to do it in a way that's strategic and going to be advantageous to the American consumer. Uh, but it is something the president is still considering. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Rouse. I appreciate you again being out there in the rain outside the White House. That's Dr. Cecilia Rouse. She is the chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. Coming up today is the last day of hearings on the January 6th committee. We're going to go over what to expect with Bloomberg government congressional reporter Emily Wilkins. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. A few minutes from now, the committee on Capitol Hill uh, the, investigating what the events of January 6th, when there was that attempt at insurrection at the Capitol, will begin what is slated to be its last set of hearings. To take us through and set the stage, we welcome now Bloomberg government congressional reporter Emily Wilkins. So, Emily, what do we expect today? Well, in just a couple minutes, the committee could start what could potentially be their last public hearing and their last chance to make the pitch to the American public about the events of January 6th and the role that former President Trump played. Now, unlike other hearings, David, this one's going to be taking a step back. They're not going to be focused on a specific topic, but they're going to be focused on kind of the overall timeline and filling in some of the gaps. The committee has recently gotten a lot of data and internal communications from the Secret Service. Some of those will feature at the hearing hearing today. We're also expecting to see potential documentary footage of Trump advisor Roger Stone, as well as potentially hear some of the testimony that Ginny Thomas, wife of uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, gave in her the hours that she spent with the committee just a few weeks ago. Are there any live witnesses? There won't be any live witnesses this time. We are going to be hearing from some witnesses, seeing video of witnesses we've already seen in the past, as well as hearing testimony and seeing video from potential new witnesses, according to committee staffers. At this point, who's the audience for this? Is it the American people? Are they thinking about referring something to the Justice Department? Who is this for? It's definitely for the American people, David. I, I think there was a reason that this hearing was scheduled previously and then the hurricane hit and they decided to reschedule it for now. I think so it could have more attention, more focus. And certainly it's the American people given that they are going to the polls. But you make a really good point. The Justice Department is, of course, doing their own investigation into the events of January 6. And while this committee's work is going to end at the end of this year, the Justice Department's investigation is likely to keep going past then. And so we expect the committee to be putting out a report that details a lot of the uh, uh, interviews they've had, documents they've got, and investigations they've done, and really sort of put it all together. If the primary uh, target here for this committee is the American people, is there any indication the American people are changing their minds because of these hearings? I mean, we've had quite a few of these now, right? There's a lot of information that's come out. Uh, is anybody changing their mind? That's a really good question, David. I mean, we have seen some polling that suggests that folks who were aware of January 6th have now learned more, but it doesn't exactly seem to be shifting a lot of minds one way or the other. I mean, it, it is important for the American people to understand what happened in January 6th and what happened lean up to the insurrection. But if you look at what's on the uh, American people's minds right now, what's on voters' minds, it's still the economy. It's still inflation. It's still abortion to a certain extent. There hasn't been quite as much focus of uh, for voters and for the American people on what happened. Of course, the committee says that the most important thing, though, is to make sure that the record is accurate and clear for history. It won't go down as be being particularly good for the careers of the Republicans serving on the committee, will it? This will be both the, the final uh, really shot for the two Republicans who are on the committee. Uh, Congressman Adam Kinzinger, he was already planning on retiring. And then Congresswoman Liz Cheney, she lost her primary in Wyoming to another Republican. It was a two to one loss, so it was huge for her. And it really raises the question about what's going to be the path for Republicans like Cheney, like Kinzinger, like others who supported Trump's impeachment going forward. I mean, we've only seen the Republican Party, particularly here in the Capitol, 
shift further to the right. And so it really raises a big question mark for what the future is going to be. Emily, thank you so very much. That's Bloomberg's Emily Wilkins reporting from the Capitol. Check out the Balance of Power newsletter on the terminal and also online. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. In our second hour, we're going to talk with former Democratic Congressman Joe Crowley about what today's inflation numbers mean for the midterms. This is Bloomberg.